initially, uh, we didn't know a lot about Echoes. Um, we used to send money and we sent money to Echoes and to those that we support through Echoes, um, but really had no idea of the actual organization behind uh, the name. We were looking at what we did as mission in our church and who we supported. Uh, so we met John Aitken probably about three or four years ago now, and he filled us in and showed us the incredible world of Echoes and all that they're involved in. And from then, uh, we've kind of grown our development. That meeting changed everything. Uh, uh, Jason and I, a couple of others met with John, and um, that was really just uh, quite a surprise for us that what Echoes did. And since then, we have people who are coming through Gateway who are interested in mission, and Echoes have been an amazing benefit with that. We've had a family who um, went to Tilsley and did the, um, the course there and have been sent out as missionaries now in partnership with Echoes and us. And that sort of partnership has been just so amazing. From be before they went, uh, the training they had, the conversations we, we had with Rupert, and it was really fantastic to have such wise advice coming through. And there was a need really for additional support. And very quickly, he'd arranged for um, three people from Echoes to go and visit and to um, build on the support we were giving by by video, if you like, here. Uh, so although we will visit later in the year, that Im immediate response was fantastic. The other area that I learned a lot about Echoes was actually coming to the conference several years ago now. Um, it was my first uh, kind of introduction to the work of Echoes, but also to the other areas like First Serve. Uh, that's where I met Danielle and we went and introduced a couple of our young people to First Serve, one of which went on to do First Serve for the year and I think it's fair to say completely transformed her life mm, yeah, and yeah. her calling, uh, the recognition on God's calling on her life because of her time at Tilsley and because of her time at a church in the UK and then she went to Rome as well to, to work in Rome. Just completely transformed her, mm. her spiritual life I think probably. Yeah. Uh, so the beauty that First Serve brought to her life is in fact fantastic. I think for us as well, Terry, myself and one of the other leaders went out to visit Amanda who we support in uh, France, mm. in Lviv, um, to learn a little bit about that and there we came in contact with those from Brass Tax who are working uh, on the physical site out there in bits and pieces so that was an interesting kind of information gathering for us to realise there's other arms as well who kind of play in and partner mm. with Echoes um, so for us, really, I think, again, as Terry said about sending people who are called, as a church leader, I knew nothing about where to start with those sorts of things and what was the right way to do things. Yeah. And so Echoes coming alongside and partnering us as, a, as individuals, but then as a leadership and then as a church as well, yeah. has been so freeing for us because I don't think we would have got those people onto the yeah. field um, and if we had, it wouldn't have been in, done in such an excellent way. Supportive way. The difference is that before we were on our own, but with the Echoes, we know that there's a partnership there. We can pick up the phone, we can have a video call with the guys from Echoes, and, and immediately there's, there's really high level yeah. and very Christian support. That means we're not on our own. It's made a massive difference mm. to mm. how we send mm. Mm. and obviously what we mm. do when they're, when they're there. What we now have is a much more secure route for someone who says to mm. us, we're, we're interested in mission. Um, we would have been looking through options much more on our own, whereas now we, we will look at the Echoes options, we've got a route through there, and that means that there is, it's much more likely that people will move from our church through interest to supported mission work, which is good and um, less risky in the sense of we know that what they're doing is something that their calling is being backed by good support from us and Echoes. Mm. That, that three-way partnership is really powerful.
invite you to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia for IBCM8 to be held in June 2023. We will gather there under the banner, The Love of Christ Compels Us. Why don't you plan to join us to be encouraged, inspired and motivated for your service for Jesus Christ. Looking forward to seeing you in KL. Hello everyone. Welcome to the city of Kuala Lumpur. At IBCM8, participants will have the opportunity to choose from seven network tracks, including mission, leadership, youth, church ministry, children, training in theology, evangelism and church planning. At ABCM8, half of our main sessions will be focused on needs and issues of the younger generation. Make it in a conference for all. This conference has meant meeting a lot of brothers from all around the world, being very encouraged to continue the ministry and learning from everybody's experience. It's been a very good experience. Yeah. Seeing different people from different countries, all with the same view and views and everything. I like it because I'm learning a lot about a lot of countries. What IBCM means to me is inspiring to see God working all over the world and learning from other people of other cultures. Following IBCM 8, you can participate in a short-term mission trip to one of a number of countries in Asia. Just as such a good experience, and I do not regret spending one cent on it. One, two, three, Jesus! Beautiful. I'll be in Malaysia in 2023 for IBCMA. I hope to see you there. See you soon. My name is Richard Hartnett and I work as the ECHOES International Equipping and Training Manager. I'd just like to tell you about Tilsley College, a ministry of GLOW Europe. The college has been involved in training people for Christian ministry for a number of years and my wife and I both studied there before serving in Peru. The one year certificate program combines classroom learning with practical experience in various areas, including cross-cultural ministry. It's a great way to deepen your understanding develop your skills and see what God might be calling you to. Echoes International has partnered with GLOW and Tilsley College to support several students each year. So if you have an interest in cross-cultural mission, the support of your local church, and feel that a year at Tilsley would help you to explore this, then we'd be keen to talk with you about that. Also, if you are a church leader and feel that one of your members would benefit from the Tilsley Certificate Year as preparation for cross-cultural ministry, whether in the UK or overseas, then please contact us. The time that my wife and I spent at Tilsley certainly gave us a good foundation for the subsequent years we spent in Peru. And if you feel this experience would be a good next step for you or for someone that you know in your church, then please get in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you.
Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, a very warm welcome to Echoes International's 150th anniversary event here in Liverpool, an event that we're running in partnership with IBCM and which will be live linked to um, approximately 100 countries. So uh, welcome wherever you are in the world. If you're tuning in to this event from Liverpool, England, uh, it's very good to have you with us. This is a very significant and special uh, event for us. Um, Dr. Ian Burness is going to uh, deliver his lecture, A Legacy for the Future as a historian and a missiologist reflecting on the global impact of 150 years of mission uh, by the Brethren movement. This is being recorded and uh, it will be available online after the event as well. First, I'm going to ask uh, Jim Armstrong, the General Director of Echoes International, to come and lead us in prayer. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> Let's just pray. <clears throat> Father, we give thanks for our time together this afternoon. We just ask for a sense of your presence with us as we meet like this. We give thanks we come to a God of mission, a mission that was planned way before eternity and was executed here on earth and is destined for glory. And it's all made possible because of the Lord Jesus and what he's done at the cross. And we take time this afternoon just to give thanks for the salvation that you've brought us into, for the relationship that you've given us and that we can celebrate mission from Jerusalem, Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. We give thanks we look back over hundreds of years and see your hand in this world with so many coming to the Lord Jesus and salvation. And Father, we just take time to give thanks for that legacy. But we also ask for the challenge. We think of the need of the world today. We think of the need for the gospel to continue to go forward. And Father, we just ask as Ian would bring this lecture that you would bless him, work through him, speak through him, and that we can give thanks for what you've done but be involved in what you're doing and what you're about to do in future years. And so, Father, for this afternoon, for all that's happening, we just ask for a sense of your blessing with us and a sense of your challenge as we listen to Ian uh, over this lecture. And so for this time, we do give thanks in the Saviour's precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, how do you recognize 150 years of mission? That was the challenge facing some of us as we were asked to form a little group and consider how to do that. We came up with a, a few things. One was to make a coffee table book uh, with 150 photographs described by 150 stories in approximately 150 words. Uh, to illustrate 150 years of mission. And uh, these are uh, available, um, and to all those who are here today, they're uh, available um, at the back. We also wanted to put something together for young people, and we've created um, a pack entitled Mission Expedition, and it has 12 stories, uh, linked with 12 Bible passages, and each of the stories has an accompanying worksheet. And if you go to the QR code on the folder, it will link you with other resources on the website, um, recipes and activities um, that you'll be able to do with uh, young people. So we hope that those will be well used around uh, the UK and maybe even further afield. And uh, we created this exhibition, which is here in this uh, 
hall today and also made the um, film that we've been watching here um, as well. This is the 20th event so far. And the little trailer that you can see outside is a bit like sort of Pandora's box. When you see this exhibition, you'd never believe it all packed up and fitted into that little trailer that's out in the car park. But that's been crisscrossing the country, and we've got another 13 events to go before the end uh, of the year. Um, we also, in order to celebrate this event, approached Ian Burness and asked him, as our resident historian, uh, a bit like um, Luke in Acts, really, the one who is the doctor who also writes. Um, and we were delighted when he accepted our invitation to write a paper and to deliver a lecture on the significant contribution made by the Brethren Movement to global mission. And we're very, very pleased to be partnering with IBCM in its delivery. In all of our 150th events um, that we've held, we've not only celebrated God's faithfulness over 150 years, but at each event we brought the challenge of the unfinished task, with the prayer that the Lord of the harvest will raise up the next generation for the work that is still to be done, of taking the gospel of our Lord Jesus to the nations. And we trust that this event uh, will be used to that end um, as well. John Aitken, um, is now going to come and introduce Ian before he gives uh, his address. Thank you. Well, it is a privilege for me to introduce you to Dr. Ian Burness, who with his family served in Zambia as a missionary doctor for 11 years. And then with Echoes of Service based in Bath for 23 years, the majority of the time he was with ECHOS, uh, he was general director. Ian is currently chairman of the IBCM network. Um, he's also chairman of the Opal Trust and is in, on the board of Shared Hope. He's also the author of two books. One, the biography of Fred Stanley Arnott, a missionary pioneer to Central Africa, and also medicine in remote places, and these are available uh, today, which is an account of Ian's own missionary experience, but it's not just telling the story of himself, it's highlighting key mission issues that we should consider, or anyone who serves in mission should consider. As one of the most informed mission watchers, uh, Ian uh, I would suggest as an expert on mission, especially in the Brethren context. And so as Rupert has said, we've asked Ian today to give this 150th anniversary lecture to address the topic of a legacy for the future, assessing the assembly movement's contribution to world mission with the aim of inspiring us in a new and in a fresh way that God's work would continue and that we would continue to see what God is doing across the globe. So welcome Ian and thank you for all the work you've already done and we pray that God would bless you as you come to speak now. Thank you. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you, wherever you are in the world today. I know some people are probably staying out of their beds late, maybe in Australia or New Zealand, but uh, thank you for joining us. It's good to be with you here in Liverpool, but from Liverpool, of course, we are going to be traveling around the world today and thinking of this remarkable story of the past 150 years seeing what God has done, because ultimately this is a work of God, 
And although we should not be proud, we should be grateful for what God has done through this very small section of the body of Jesus Christ. This is going to be an historical study, and for some of you, you might begin groaning at this point, but uh, I always think the words of Winston Churchill are very important when it comes to history. Churchill is ascribed with writing, I find that the more I look back, the further I can look forward. Good statement, isn't it? I find that the more I look back, the further I am able to look forward. So we're going to look back, but we're also going to look forward today because we are at a point in time where the work of God is at a crucial stage and we want to think about that too. 150 years of human history covers four human generations. From the age of steam to the internet, from 1.4 billion on planet Earth to over 8 billion people inhabiting our planet. The number of Christians, both nominal and evangelical, has also grown remarkably during that time. And some form of the Church of Jesus Christ is now found in every nation on Earth. We now live in an era of a truly global Christian church. But we must begin back, not in 1872, but in 1793, with the emergence of what is called the modern missionary movement. Early 18th century Moravian missions, which impacted the Wesleys and George Whitfield, also influenced William Carey, Northampton shoemaker turned Baptist pastor. Carey is rightly called the father of modern missions for his famous study and the Global State of the Gospel, which was published in 1792. This led to the founding of the Baptist Missionary Society with William Carey as their first missionary. He spent 40 years in effective ministry and Bible translation in India. Carey's example led to the explosion of activity as new societies emerged to engage in cross-cultural mission, a process that accelerated in the 19th century. The Brethren Movement was born in this era, and an early associate, Anthony Norris Groves, played a crucial role with a radical approach to missions. Groves had felt a missionary calling from a young age, but his study of the scriptures challenged his ecclesiology and his attitude to material possessions. Distributing all of his wealth, he called for radical discipleship in his pamphlet, Christian Devotedness. He practiced living by faith, a position also adopted by his brother-in-law, George Muller, in Bristol. In 1829, Groves embarked with others for Baghdad in what they regarded as a revival of apostolic mission. They expected to be able to preach in Baghdad without learning other languages, as happened at Pentecost. Of course, when they didn't, didn't preach this way, they took, set to and learned Arabic. However, the Baghdad mission was no success. Groves lost his wife and daughter to plague, and in time, the mission there was abandoned. He moved on to India, where he traveled widely, fellowshiped with all evangelical missionaries, and practiced reliance on God to supply his needs. Groves emphasized the following as his principles of operation in mission. He saw his role as a spiritual partnership with other believers, not the founding of a circle of Grove's churches or a new mission entity. He saw that teams of Indian evangelists would be the ones who would take the gospel to their own people as messengers of the gospel, indigenizing the work from the very beginning. He never criticized the methods of others or other workers or other agencies. And Groves argued that a missionary should be sent by a church to plant churches not appointed by a committee to promote a society. And so he wrote, the grand point to be arrived at is that the church act so as to prove that the work society's endeavor to accomplish with the world's help can be done better because more scripturally by the church herself. Groves influenced George Muller to live by faith. Although primarily remembered for the orphanages he built in the city of Bristol, Muller had a deep interest in foreign missions, and Groves had tried to persuade Muller to join him in Baghdad. Muller established the Scriptural Knowledge Institution for Home and Abroad. It had four distinct objectives. The fourth object is of present interest, 
to aid in supplying the wants of missionaries and missionary schools. We desire to assist such missionaries and missionary schools as shall seem to us going on most according to scripture and as may, may most particularly require assistance. Muller became the main supporter of early brethren mission. Others were challenged by Groves to work in India. William Bowden, a stonemason, and George Beer, a shoemaker, attended Ebenezer Chapel in Barnstable, sitting under R.C. Chapman's ministry. When Groves visited in 1835, they responded to the gospel needs of India. Accompanying Groves, they settled among the Telugu people in the Godavari Delta. The work commenced then continues to the present, expanding widely throughout India today. Leonard Strong was an English naval officer who, after his conversion, became an Anglican clergyman. He felt the call of God to work in Georgetown, Guyana, where his study of scripture led him also in an independent path. When George Muller heard of Strong's work, he began to support him. Strong was joined by workers from Britain, and the first church planted in Georgetown grew to over 600. Evangelistic work spread, and by 1853, Strong reported there were 10 workers serving in Guyana. In 1891, George Moraine and his wife were sent from Guyana to join the developing work in Angola, followed by other couples also from that land who crossed to Africa. Robert Cleaver Chapman, who ministered at Barnstable in England for 70 years, had also a deep interest in the propagation of the gospel in Spain then extremely hostile to evangelistic preaching. He first visited Spain in 1838 and became an advocate for mission in that land. Two of the earliest workers, W. Gould and G. Lawrence, were guided to their field of service by Chapman in 1863. Through Chapman's influence, Spain became one of the largest fields for Brethren mission in the late 19th and into the 20th century. The remarkable story in Italy began with Count Piero Giacardini of Florence, who was converted through reading the Bible in Italian. When discovered meeting with some other believers, he was imprisoned and then sent into voluntary exile to London. There he met other Italian Christians and fellowship with the brethren. Teodorico Rossetti was another exile who, encouraged by Giacardini to study the scriptures, also came to saving faith in Christ. When greater political liberty came to Italy, both Rossetti and Giacardini returned to their homeland. Rossetti was commended to Italy by the Orchard Street Assembly in London, and Robert Chapman spoke at the farewell service. Rossetti settled in Alessandria, while the Count returned to Florence, both using the greater liberty to spread the gospel in their homeland. Known as the Strait Settlement in the 19th century, Malaya and Singapore occupied a key position and the first mission workers to Penang in 1859 were Mr. and Mrs. John Chapman from Bristol. They were joined by the McDonald's who served in Malaya until 1911. Philip Robinson, also from Bristol, first went to Australia before settling in Singapore where he built a successful business, Robinson's Stores. As a committed follower of Christ and friend of Muller's, he also spent time in gospel ministry, planting the first assembly in Singapore at Brass Bassa Road, called Bethesda, in tribute to Muller. Although Groves was an influential figure, as he was serving in India, more dominant personalities had priority, and overseas mission work did not grow significantly in the early decades. Although J.N. Darby was actively ministering and planting fellowships in Europe, he was also involved in the developing conflicts, and which ultimately led to schism. Thus, from 1829 to 1853, no regular news was published in any journal or magazine. Information was shared mainly through letters sent to British contacts. Few workers went out, and there was little support for the work apart from what was transmitted through George Muller. The missionary reporter launched by James Van Sommer of Tottenham was the first attempt to report on mission work among the brethren. Van Sommer outlined his objects. The Lord of the harvest has sent forth many laborers into his harvest who are unconnected with any society. 
Some of these are more immediately dependent on their Heavenly Father for their daily needs. As there is no missionary periodical which refers to such laborers, they are consequently known to few Christians and it is feared lack both help and sympathy. Van Sommer had a motto, every church a missionary society. The Missionary Reporter published a list of, worker, of 34 workers serving in six areas in 1853. Some, such as Hudson Taylor, were associated with missionary societies, and two national workers were also included in this list. A list of 20 names was published in 1854 of those serving abroad without any guaranteed assistance, but looking to the Lord to supply them through whatever channels he please with such temporal things as they have need of. The reporter ran until 1862, and the main reason for its demise was financial, as no charge was made for the publication. A new magazine was launched in 1872 by Dr. John Lindsay McLean and Henry Groves, son of A.N. Groves. They outlined their objectives. Our object is fellowship in the gospel and the spreading of the knowledge of the Lord in other lands. They continued... Of late years, however, the power and sufficiency of the name of the Lord alone has been proved by many of his people in various ways. And thus some of his servants have gone forth to other lands simply in his name. They also recognize the role of the self-supporting worker. The first edition of the Missionary Echo contained reports from Germany, Italy, Spain, Portugal, India, Cuba, and British Guyana. Policies followed were similar to the missionary reporter, with any emphasis on finance and gifts downplayed. The magazine cost one half penny or a shilling for one year post-free, recognizing that without payment, the light magazine was likely to go the way of its predecessor. At the end of the first year of operation, the statement of gifts received noted that 162 pounds, 14 shillings and five pence had been received and distributed to work in 11 countries. The founders set out their biblical understanding of their role. The foundation of the ministry, they believed, was fellowship in the gospel, and the key verse was Philippians 1, verse 5. It was a gospel-centered mission because they were concerned about spreading the knowledge of the Lord in other lands. They believed the mission would be Christ-authorized. Some of his servants have gone forth to other lands simply in his name. The authority came from the risen Lord himself. It was local church supported, local church sending mission. They went on their own responsibility to the Lord and as appeared to their brethren. The suitability of workers was confirmed by their local church. Home-based engagement was central for news of the work would be read by Christians who would then pray for that work and the workers. This perhaps provides a theological rationale for the existence of echoes of service, allowing 150 years of activity to be defended within a biblical framework. The missionary echo emerged during an upsurge in mission interest in Britain. The evangelical revivals of 1859 to 1860 led to a sustained period of growth which continued into the first decades of the 20th century. It also led to the emergence of a new breed of mission agencies classified as the faith mission sector. These took their place alongside the classical missionary societies of the earlier 19th century. Many from Brethren Fellowship serve with these agencies, the most popular being the China Inland Mission, given the roots of its founder and the support provided by George Muller. The new magazine was popular with a growing circulation and readership More letters were published, the range of countries grew, and funds sent through the Bath office increased. This was mirrored in Scotland by the setting up of home and foreign mission funds in 1881, with close cooperation between the offices in Glasgow and Bath from the very beginning. The name of the magazine became Echoes of Service in 1885, and soon the title Echoes was widely used, and enthusiastic use was reported. As the number of workers grew, Echoes magazine was published twice monthly from 1890 until 1917. Alongside the editing of the magazine, the role as treasurers of funds sent for mission support also grew. 
Bold advances were now being made into new areas. The links with Hudson Taylor led many to serve with the CIM, but others followed a more independent pathway. Letters from China were published in 1872, where C.H. Judge and G. Stott were serving. New recruits began to emerge for China, and the Echo Centenary volume of 1872 included the names of 254 workers who had served in that land. The work was located mainly in three provinces, Jiangxi, Shandong, and Inner Mongolia. Workers were also hit by the Boxer Uprising of 1900, when 189 missionaries with different societies and thousands of Chinese Christians lost their lives. Tragedy hit the Brethren community shortly after when the Kinghams were killed by a mob in the provincial capital of Nanchang. Work in Central Africa will forever be linked with Frederick Stanley Arnott, a young Scot who was deeply influenced as when as a boy he met, met David Livingston. In 1881, aged 23, Arnott left for Central Africa. But when his colleague's health broke down, he traveled north alone to his first, first objective, the north bank of the Zambezi River. This was only the beginning, for he eventually reached the kingdom of Chief Nsiri at Bunkeya in southern Congo in February 1886. As he traveled alone into the center of Africa, Arnott recorded his fears. But with courage and faith, he went on to begin the work of evangelism. When reinforced in December 1887 by the arrival of Charles Swan from England and William Faulkner from Canada, Arnott returned to Britain. There he recruited a party of 14 who traveled with him to Africa. These laid the foundations of an expanding work in Congo, Angola, and Zambia. Of the 14 who traveled to Africa with honor, three were dead within three months, the heavy toll of early years of African mission. The party included Dr. Walter Fisher, who established Kalengi Hospital in Zambia, and Dan Crawford, who at Luanza in Congo translated the Luba Sangha Bible. From the early bases established, work spread over succeeding years when Central Africa became the largest field for Brethren mission. Hundreds served in evangelism, church planting, Bible teaching, translation of scripture, education, medical work, and printing. Another new field was North Africa, mainly Algeria and Morocco. Miss Gillard heard of the needs in Kabylia, where she settled in 1883, and built a house to serve as an orphanage and a clinic. H.G. Lamb worked in the mountain villages of Kabylia, facing fanatical opposition. When local villagers attempted to burn down the mission house, the missionaries watched from the inside as any attempt to escape was impossible. But God intervened as a downpour prevented them starting the fire. On another occasion, a fire was coming toward the mission buildings. Lamb stood on a stone pillar and prayed, Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. The wind changed, the property was saved, and gradually the people's attitude changed through the power of God at work in their midst. In 1867, the first gospel preaching in Spanish was permitted in Argentina, leading to an expansion of gospel work. John Ewan was the first Brethren missionary in 1882. He itinerated widely and was joined by other workers, including the Torres, the Paines, and the Langrens. Some Christians came to work in Argentina in the expanding railway network. Several worked at their day job, then preached the gospel in the evening and at weekends. This led to the establishment of new local churches in the towns along the line of rail. Today, there are an estimated 1,500 or more local churches in Argentina, with a growing number of workers serving inside and also outside of the country too. It is not possible to cover every new initiative, but we note how the movement spread in the English-speaking world to Australia, to New Zealand, to Canada, and to the United States of America. As vision and knowledge increased, so these countries also began to contribute to the mission force around the world by sending new workers. Early advances in Spain and Italy have been noted, while Switzerland had been involved since the start of the movement in the 1820s. France and Netherlands date their origins to the 1850s, and gradual expansion took place in Europe to Germany, Faroe Islands, Portugal, Denmark, 
Iceland and Romania as the work began to grow and spread. Other developments in Asia during the 19th century included work in Myanmar, or Burma as it was then known, Hong Kong and Laos, where Swiss brethren made a remarkable contribution over many years. The first recorded work in the West Indies was in Barbados, followed by Bermuda, the Bahamas and Granada. In Central and South America, growth began in Brazil, followed by Uruguay, Mexico, Peru and Bolivia. So by the end of the 19th century, this was indeed a global work. What can be called the first wave of sending began in the last decades of the 19th century and continued until the First World War. By 1900, 438 workers were serving in 27 countries. And when hostilities broke out in 1914, there were 671 workers identified with ECOS who were serving in 50 countries. Surprisingly, between 1914 and 1918, there was an overall increase in the number as the main battlefields lay in Europe and other parts of the world were possible. However, by 1917, any new workers came from the United States, Canada, Australia, or New Zealand. Major developments were also taking place in the home sending bases, which in early years was primarily Britain. These were seen in financial support, pre-field training, and the setting up of missionary study classes. There was a steady growth in mission support with an inevitable pause during the war years. Gift categories expanded, and by 1895 included gifts for passages, for widows, schools, buildings, and drugs. In 1905, an Indian famine fund, a sanatorium in Central Africa, and a mission house in St. Vincent were also added to the gift categories. An important development in these years was also in the training of missionary candidates. Huntington Stone, a wealthy businessman from Greenwich, used a large proportion of his income to support mission work. Prior to his activity, some candidates underwent training at the East London Institute for Home and Foreign Missions, run by Grattan and Fanny Guinness, linked to the developing faith mission movement. From the 1880s until his death in 1916, Stone contributed by providing accommodation in his large home, funds for training at London institutions. His influence was wide for he interviewed potential new workers, assessed candidates' abilities, and reported their examination results from their studies as well, which are still there in Echo's office in the candidates' books. The missionary study class movement was another important initiative. Arthur Rendell Short, professor of surgery at Bristol University, was impacted by the student volunteer movement in the United States, where in the early 20th century, student volunteers constituted half of the total Protestant overseas missionary force. Short attended a missionary study class in Bristol, initially as a missionary candidate. He began to replicate these, appealing through Echoes magazine. By 1912, 60 MSCs had been started, and a magazine, Links of Help, was published presenting mission needs. These classes reached their peak in the 1920s and had a major impact on missionary sending in this era. The carnage of the First World War interrupted the steady growth of the evangelical movement. It also affected the opinions of many ordinary citizens towards the visible Christian church and turned many mainline and nonconformist denominations towards theological liberalism, impacting their overseas mission work. The brethren were generally unaffected by this trend, immunized from the liberal trends by an unwavering commitment to scripture. In the interwar years, brethren grew in Britain and are credited by some with keeping the evangelical flame alight. Oliver Barclay observed that much of the best work nationwide was in fact being done by the independent brethren. So the armistice of November 1918 was therefore followed by a second wave of missionary sending. A total of 508 new workers joined the mission force between 1920 and 1929 before dropping during the next decade when 386 were added. Although most were still sent from Britain, during the 1930s numbers increased from the USA, Canada, Australia and New Zealand and other parts. Some from the second wave of sending penetrated new areas, 
although the majority of these new recruits reinforced already existing mission work. The largest fields were India, China, and Central Africa, which required a growing supply of teachers and health professionals to staff institutions. Institutional growth was further advanced in India, although new outreaches were also developing. There was a steady recruitment of new workers for China, the highest number being reached before the Japanese invasion of July 1937. The outbreak of the Spanish Civil War was catastrophic as most workers had to leave Spain during that conflict. Alfred and Anne Houston relocated from Sudan to Nigeria to work in the Igala Kingdom. Joined by Raymond Dibble, they began to translate the New Testament into Igala in 1924. When the Dibbles were forced to leave Nigeria in 1949, persecution broke out against the local believers. Buildings were burnt down, Christian leaders imprisoned for refusing to sacrifice to idols, and the translation work by this point had produced six copies of each book of the New Testament which had not yet been printed. Scattered by the persecution, Christians divided these up and hand copied a hundred rough New Testaments. Many were worn out through use, while some learned complete books by heart. On returning in 1945, they found 50 churches, many established in new areas. God had preserved his people, and with the help of the Holy Spirit, the work had grown spontaneously. John Ollie left New Zealand in 1919 and served in North Africa for five years before moving to Nigeria. When challenged by Dougal Campbell, who had previously worked in Central Africa, about the unreached people around Lake Chad, Ollie, with two Mbai Christians, moved to Fort Lamy, now Jamina, in 1926. He began to translate the New Testament into Mbai, a work that took 17 years. Ollie worked in Abechi, a Muslim city near the Sudan border. Following his first converts and baptisms, he was arrested, deported, and sent to Doba in southern Chad. After 36 years, he took his first furlough in 1955, when he died in Sydney, Australia. But workers from Australia, New Zealand, France, Britain, and North America developed the work and today in Chad, there's a growing movement of over 1,100 local churches served by over 2,000 workers. New areas were opened in the Caribbean during these years. Work was established in Trinidad and Tobago, then in Jamaica and St. Lucia around the same time. St. Kitts followed in 1936. In the Spanish-speaking Caribbean, work developed first in Cuba and then in the Dominican Republic. Further expansion was also taking place in South America, which included Paraguay, Bolivia, Peru, although earlier work had started there in 1893, Chile, and French Guiana. Work began in Ecuador just before the onset of the Second World War. And other advances in this era led to new work beginning in the Philippines, in Egypt, in Japan, in Fiji, and Pakistan, which was then part of British India. Although the main thrust in these areas followed the Second World War, foundations were laid for future expansion. The global turbulence of the Second World War led to the eclipse of European power and the emergence of new global superpowers whose ideological confrontation shaped the world of the late 20th and 21st centuries. The center of world mission crossed the Atlantic to North America, particularly to the United States, so that by the 1970s, two-thirds of the missionary force were coming from there. Another unexpected result of the war was that many Christian military personnel were exposed to new areas of the world. Many of these who had had their first encounter as soldiers returned to East Asia and Europe as missionaries in the post-war years. In the post-war world as well, new methods emerged served by new agencies which took their place alongside the old. Some of these filled specialized roles as, Wy as Wycliffe Bible translators, for example, while New Tribes Mission focused on reaching remote and unreached peoples. Operation Mobilization under the dynamic leadership of George Verber sent teams of young people across the world, and many who went for a few weeks or months ended up in as full-time workers. 
Many of the early leaders of OM had their origins in the Brethren movement and drew in assemblies for short and long-term recruits. A third surge of new workers followed the Second World War. From 1946 to 1950, 419 names were added to the global list, mainly, but not solely, from the English-speaking world. By 1950, 1,158 names were listed by Echoes on the, prayer, on the prayer handbook. The number of countries listed did not grow as much, for although new fields were opened, some close to expatriate workers. The Chinese Revolution of 1949 led to the complete evacuation, although some transferred to other parts of Asia, the majority of workers returned home. By 1950, Central Africa was the dominant field, where 25% of the total workforce served in three countries, which gained 112 new workers since 1946. India added 68 new expatriate workers, and numbers began to decline in the 1950s. China disappeared as an active country, although Japan gained as some moved there. Initial post-war sending from Britain was followed by a gentle decline during the 1950s and 60s. This was more than matched by the increase in sending from other areas. Mission to Papua New Guinea was led by New Zealand and Australia. A central component of the work in new tribal areas was an emphasis in Bible training delivered through a network of basic Bible schools. By 2010, 14 Bible schools were running, the largest number among an evangelical group. Church growth, which was steady in early years, began to accelerate as expatriate workers intentionally started to decline. By 1985, there were around 200 churches planted, while the figure in 2019 was over 460. Work in East Africa began when Dudley Dalton entered Tanzania in 1948. Germany's historic links with Tanzania drew workers from Vidanes to the south of the country, while British missionaries concentrated in the north. Work began in Nairobi, Kenya in the late 1950s, and also opened in the former Belgian territory of Burundi, led by the Johnson family from the United States. This initiative spread across the border to Rwanda through Jack and Marion Lacey, who settled in Kigali. Uganda was entered in the mid-1960s. Other African fields developed during this period included Senegal, Botswana, Malawi, and Mozambique. Solid work was done in Ethiopia by Swedish evangelicals in the 19th century, and a new field for brethren work opened when John and Marty Flynn arrived from Northern Ireland in 1952. The work expanded to three areas, developing slowly until the communist takeover in 1977, when all expatriate workers left. This was not, however, the end of the story, for growth accelerated under local leadership during these difficult years. Until now, there are 261 churches with more than 300 full-time workers, baptizing about 3,000 new believers each year. Until recent decades, mission, mission to the Muslim world was neglected, apart from some stalwart souls who tackled this most difficult challenge, regarded as either too difficult, too dangerous, or impossible to reach. In the post-colonial world, expatriate workers in North Africa declined, but the number of believers grew. Following partition in 1947, Pakistan developed as a new field, staffed mainly by workers from Britain and from Germany. Other fields entered where Muslims were the majority included Jordan in the late 1940s, Indonesia in the 1950s, and a new attempt to work in Turkey in 1961. As the number of workers grew, it was clear that one mission handbook could no longer serve such a large mission force, and separate lists of workers were necessary. This was the natural evolution of a movement that represented around 1,200 mission workers. After consultation, the USA, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand created separate handbooks with their own list of workers. North America included workers from the USA and Canada, while Australia and New Zealand each produced separate handbooks from 1972. Prior to the setting up of the separate workers list, the total number of workers listed in ECHO's prayer guide was 997 names, of whom 520 were commended from the United Kingdom. 
1972, the Echo's Daily Prayer Guide contained 630 names. Those who were retained from other areas were either married to a UK worker or had no established mission service agency in their sending country to fulfill the role provided by Echoes. For several years, the Daily Prayer Guide included the number of workers from other countries and names of countries previously included in the Prayer Guide. However, as new sending countries emerged, it became difficult to obtain accurate figures, so this practice was dropped. This was a pragmatic decision, but it could be argued that this led to some fragmenting of a powerful missionary movement. Changing times regard, required a more flexible approach to mission. Short-term missions were first developed by OOM and Colin Tilsley, raised in India, recruited young people for teams with gospel literature outreach. This began in Sydney, Australia, and a base was developed at Motherwell in Scotland as well. The role of the tent maker was rediscovered as this platform enabled access to closed areas of the world. Home-based workers who worked among ethnic minority groups and those with practical roles such as brass tacks were also recognized. The seconding of workers to agencies who could provide care and team support in remote and dangerous places was another needed initiative. Several key events have shaped our present age. The fall of the Iron Curtain, the apparent triumph of the Three West, has taken us from a bipolar Cold War world to a complex and multipolar era. The war in terror following 9-11 has added to this instability. Although highlighting the spiritual needs of the Islamic world, it has raised the risk and threat faced by those in some frontline situations. China, now a major superpower, is supremely confident of what it has and will achieve in the 21st century. Mission has therefore been affected by these great global events. Eastern European countries where Christians survived during 45 years of communism have seen church growth. For example, Albania, an atheistic state, has witnessed significant gospel growth. The 1.8 billion Muslims of the Islamic world have received increased attention. The task is still enormous, but there are encouraging signs of God at work among some peoples. Ralph Winter identified unreached or hidden people groups as a major mission target in 1974. Hundreds of distinct ethno-linguistic groups have still have not yet been touched by the gospel of Christ. The Chinese church, which survived all attempts to eradicate Christian faith, continues to grow and now sends workers to surrounding areas and peoples. The tension that existed between evangelism and social action in world mission has generally been resolved. Both have been rightly affirmed in what is now called integral mission. We preach the gospel of Christ and respond to human need and suffering as servants of Christ. The most significant wave of our times is the emergence of indigenous mission. Chris Wright recently stated we have moved from the industrial era of mission sending to the indigenous era. Future relationships must be as partnerships of equals where the strengths of each can be released in working together. The sending figures over a 50-year period show a steady reduction, mirroring the experience of all long-term mission agencies in the UK. Echoes is not unique in this, and also reflecting the declining number of those who were identified as brethren rooted in Britain. However, while numbers have declined in Britain, they held steady or grew in other English-speaking countries. Unless we despair, this has been more than matched by sending from areas where UK workers formerly send, serve God. The major feature of our times is the development of cross-cultural mission sending from other countries, including Korea, India, Argentina, Malaysia, Brazil, and parts of Africa. This is the wave of the present and demonstrates what God is now doing in our world. The efforts of the past have not been in vain. The wave of the present and the future will, in God's hands, be that of indigenous sending. The Brethren Movement Worldwide is published every four years by IBCM Network and in the last edition gave a total of 17,000 home and cross-cultural workers serving in the Brethren Movement Worldwide. This is what God has done and is still doing today, built on the sacrificial and foundational work of previous generations. 
On this basis, we can look forward with optimism and confidence that what God has done through the past 150 years, he will continue to do in the future. So we need in conclusion to honestly assess the contribution, as I said, of this small part of the body of Christ, the global mission. And in proper fashion, we begin with the strengths. This was a gospel and mission focused movement for the spreading of the gospel was central to the role of each local church. Personal activism was emphasized when each member was expected to serve in some capacity in the local church and if called in mission. Sacrificial living led to strong financial giving and support of the work of God. As the workforce grew, so did the support. An emphasis in calling and commitment to Christ and his service, for at its height, around 1% of assembly membership in the UK served in foreign missions, the highest percentage of any evangelical group in the UK. The missionary study class movement had a major impact in mission sending before and between the two world wars. There was a strong emphasis on the leading of the Holy Spirit in mission. This was a charismatic movement long before the word entered, the word entered general parlance. The Holy Spirit was regarded as director and controller of mission. There was a willingness to sacrifice and suffer. The recurring challenge was to make Christ Lord of all, demonstrated when several of those who went to remote and dangerous areas laid down their lives in service for Christ. The local church was placed at the heart of mission. Van Summer's motto, every local church, a missionary society was worked out through sending and supporting new workers in evangelism at home. It was administration and cost light for supporting agencies were simple in structure and kept costs as low as possible, enabling maximum resource for mission. There was a strong emphasis in living by faith, which eventually became the sole means of working, although there was also the recognition of the self-supporting tent maker. Widely read magazines and a well-attended network of conferences stimulated prayer and led to new recruits. These are some of the strengths, but we must also consider the weaknesses. An emphasis on individual call and leading of the Holy Spirit has meant that some pursued their own agenda and vision. As a result of this, working together for the greater good was sometimes forgotten. An individual call did lead to individualism. The commendation process was sometimes weak. Not every group of elders was equipped to assess candidates nor realize the responsibilities of sending and supporting cross-culturally. Some ran into problems in service with issues that had not been addressed at the point of sending. Distances and slow communication resulted in little emphasis and accountability and much work was taken in trust. The term, of course, covers more than finance, but the use of time, the ability to work with colleagues, and indigenous local churches and leaders. It is critical. Grove's model was pursued as the only model for support, forgetting that Grove's applied this flexibly, engaging in paid dental work when no other resources were available. There has sometimes been conflict rather than coordination of roles. The retreat from any social involvement which followed theological liberalism with its social gospel led at times to a very unbalanced approach. They must also always be held in tension for both have validity. With no grand strategy, the results were sometimes patchy. God is present in many advances, but an absence of coordination sometimes led to a duplication of effort. This is more visible, I believe, when the baby boomers moved into leadership, following personal goals and wanting to make an impact in a shorter time. Then there was a denigration of training by a section of the movement. Although training structures developed in the late 19th and 20th centuries and ran between the world wars, some claimed and still claim that all training should be done in the local church. While affirming that this is the best environment for spiritual growth, Specific areas of cross-cultural preparation cannot be provided by local leaders. Those lacking some cross-cultural training will have serious deficiencies in their preparation for service. 
Attacks on missionary service groups in the role have done considerable damage. While the service groups did not get everything right, and we would confess that, over a thousand workers could not be served without some administrative means. And in general, the agencies have managed to maintain a good balance. Then there's been the assumption that New Testament principles do not need to be contextualized. The return to New Testament simplicity underpinned church practices among brethren. These practices, however, demonstrated a particular cultural expression seen in the form of local churches planted by workers who transferred their home model to their field of service. We need to ask what is the most appropriate expression of a biblical principle in different contexts. The Western model of mission sending is difficult to transfer. The Brethren Movement sent several thousand workers during the past 150 years, a work of God supported by the giving of God's people. However, this model challenges Christians in the majority world who have little disposable income. Local service agencies may still require help from Western-based churches, but this support rarely comes without attached conditions and creates the danger of long-term dependency, stopping these initiatives becoming truly independent. Funders must understand the dangers of their role and seek means of true gospel partnership with emerging mission. We do indeed need the wisdom of Solomon. So let's summarize and look ahead, if we can. Andrew Walls wrote that the Christian story is not a steady, triumphant progression. It's a story of advance and recession. The tide comes in and the tide goes out. He also described two principles that have affected the work of God over the centuries, the indigenizing principle and the pilgrim principle. The gospel takes root, produces fruit, and becomes indigenized in any culture and among any people. It is recognized by each person as God's message for them through the revelation in Jesus Christ. Alongside the indigenizing principle lies the pilgrim principle, Peter writes that as God's people, we are sojourners and exiles, citizens of an earthly nation, but members of the kingdom of God. It is the proclamation of this kingdom and the invitation of all people to enter it that lies at the heart of Christian mission. There is still a great task to be done, and we're all called to contribute to this with all of God's people, as in our globalized age, we partner, we serve, and we still send the willing into God's harvest fields. What lessons can we carry away from this rapid review today? I want to emphasize three for all of us. God raised up and used generations of men and women who were consecrated to Jesus Christ and willing to give their all in his service. And with all our resources and technologies and strategies, he expects no less from us in our generation it all begins with consecration of ourselves to Jesus Christ and his service. The language of sacrifice is rarely used in Western mission contexts now. It's much more familiar to our brothers and sisters in many parts of the world where they know the reality of being despised followers of Jesus Christ. The past 150 years is punctuated with stories of those who gave their lives in a foreign field for the sake of Jesus. There will always be risk, but are we willing to lose our lives for Jesus' sake? The mission of God is a story of the sending of God, centrally in the sending of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, to be our Savior, and in the sending of his church, empowered by his Spirit, into the world to call people of every race to submit to Christ as Redeemer and Lord. He sends us until the end of the age, and still seeks those who are willing to continue the task that we have been given by our risen Lord. Thank you for listening, and may God bless you and bless this presentation to the furtherance of his work and his kingdom. Allow me just to say a huge thanks to Ian 
for what we've listened to uh, this afternoon. It's been a fantastic just study of what God has done, and it's good to look back, and it's good to celebrate that. It's good to give thanks for um, God's intervention and God in mission. But it was also a good reminder of some of the principles of mission that are still in place today. Uh, and, but more so, I think, the challenge of mission and what God is still doing. And in particular, as you think of the last three points for me in there, our response to that. Um, across the whole of the world, I'm conscious I'm talking to all sorts of different folk. How do we respond to the challenge of mission and take that forward? I'm just conscious of the amount of research and detail that's gone into that presentation. And I would like to say a huge thank you to Ian. Um, we really do appreciate it. He's covered so much. Uh, and Ian, as John said earlier on, the expertise that Ian has, we just give thanks for. And so I think I would just like to finish off by asking you, I know you've clapped already, but we're going to do it again, and just say a massive thanks to Ian. Thank you. <laughs> We've been um, celebrating the selfless, sacrificial service of mission partners, and uh, it's a very good opportunity today here in Liverpool to um, say thank you and to celebrate the selfless, sacrificial service of Ruth Cushing, who, as it happens, retires this month. So Ruth, would you like to come and receive these um, flowers uh, as a token of our thanks? And there's a card right here. And um, actually, you can come up here for a minute. You can come up uh, round on, OK, you can stay on that side. So there's some flowers, and there's a, a card for you. Um, in 2017, you wrote an article. Uh, for the Echoes magazine, in which you said, with five famous things, Multan abounds. Dirt, heat, flies, beggars, and burial grounds. When I left Multan in Pakistan, after 22 years of being involved in medical work in a Muslim context, there were many things I missed, but none of the above. <laughs> I was glad to meet them behind to leave them behind. However, two things I didn't leave behind were my ability to speak Urdu and many years' experience of sharing my life with Muslim women. And you returned and have spent another 20 years in faithful, committed service here in the UK. Ruth, thank you, and well done. Shall we just pray together? Heavenly Father, we bow in your presence and we worship you. We bless you for your mission to our world. We bless you for sending your Son, our Saviour, our Lord Jesus. We praise you that he went all the way to the cross of Calvary and gave his life to ransom and redeem human beings. We praise you that you gloriously raised him from the dead and that he has ascended, seated at your right hand, having accomplished the work that you gave him to do. We worship you, our heavenly Father. We praise you, our Lord Jesus, and we bless you, Holy Spirit, that you are still at work in our world today and that you are calling people to join, to partner in the mission of Jesus. We pray that you will be raising up people uh, for this harvest field to go and to do today what can be done in the name of the Lord Jesus to be lights in the darkness of our world and to share the glorious gospel. We pray in your name. Amen. So just a, a final few 
notices. There are copies of uh, Ian's paper, and uh, enough have been printed so that there's one for every couple, or if you're here alone, uh, please feel free to take one. Um, and copies of Ian's book. All these purchases can be made um, online. If you're representing a church or if you're grandparents or parents, you can take home um, one of those for young people. And Footsteps Worth Following is also um, available. And um, the chairman of the board uh, made an offer a while back that if you um, buy five, you can have one free. So um, <laughs> that offer is being um, uh, uh, applied today. Um, thank you all very much for coming. The exhibition um, and the film will be being shown here until um, 3.30, 4 o'clock, when we will be packing it all up and packing it away in that diddy little trailer, um, and it will be taking its next journey uh, around the country. Thank you very much. <laughs>